Well, greetings, everybody. Welcome to uh, Mission Control Houston. This is the uh, International Space Station's flight control room. Uh, this is basically the nerve center for all the activities that go on aboard the International Space Station. So uh, uh, a team of flight controllers here looks over all the systems around the clock of uh, the crew members that are on board the International Space Station. And uh, each one of uh, the positions in here monitors uh, systems, different systems, to make sure they're operating well aboard the complex. So we're real happy to uh, have uh, you guys in Pennsylvania at the uh, Corpus Christi School join us today here in Mission Control. And also, we have an expert in one of those systems joining us, Jeff Baisley. Uh, Jeff is uh, an expert in uh, basically all of the systems associated with the environmental control, the life support systems uh, aboard the station. So uh, uh, welcome to uh, Pennsylvania and also welcome, Jeff. Thanks for joining us. And we're ready to go. Um, my name's Carson. What are some of the decisions the flight director has to make? Oh, that's probably a good one for Jesse because he uh, works directly with the flight director all the time. Yes, uh, the, the flight director does have a uh, very important job here. Uh, as you know, the, the flight director is kind of the, the boss uh, when, when we're in here. Um, one of the big things that he monitors is actually the, um, the timing of everything that happens on board the space station. So. Uh, his job is to make sure that we're, we're meeting the objectives of the day. Um, sometimes you have to reprioritize things. Uh, we never like when things go wrong, but, uh, you know, definitely sometimes maintenance doesn't go right, and so then we need to reshuffle everything and make sure everything's correct. And, of course, you know, he's, he's in charge if, if we get into a, uh, a bind with uh, activities on the system side. That's a great question. Um, my name is Max, and what do you think is the most important role in mission control, and why? Ours. <laughs> yeah, that, no. that's a great question. Um, you know, mission control is a, a team, uh, so it's hard to pick one role. Um, but, in, you know, I'm a little biased, but uh, I think the systems controllers are the ones that uh, have the most important job. So, of course, we have uh, all the different systems on board, the thermal control, power, attitude control, uh, my system life support. I've also got uh, command data handling and uh, a, a way to communicate with the vehicle. Um, there's also the ground controller uh, who kind of makes sure that everything works from uh, the vehicle down here. Uh, and so the, everybody on, on that list are here 24-7, 365, and uh, so they're very important to operations. My name is Brent, and do you think we'll have another habitat up and running before the ISS program is over? And that's a very good question. Um, you know, it's definitely something that uh, we're thinking about here, uh, different habitats. Uh, I know that the ISS is definitely a big promoter of uh, going forward to creating a new habitat. There's a lot of systems on board that we're testing, um, you know, especially in my system, uh, life support. You know, we have a lot of water systems, a lot of air regeneration systems, and so by testing them in low Earth, or low Earth orbit, uh, while well, we can actually fix things uh, but before we go farther, uh, it's definitely a big priority and making sure that we get all the bugs out now. Hi, my name's Spencer. Working in mission control must be stressful. What do you do to help relieve your stress? <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, you know, it, the, the hours uh, definitely play on us a lot. As I mentioned, uh, system controllers were here 24-7, uh, 365. So, um, of course, I'm not here all the time, but, uh, you know, different shifts and the, the night shifts are a particularly tough one. Um, but to kind of relieve some of that stress, uh, you know, a lot of people uh, do exercise. So I know people in my group, uh, some of them run marathons. Uh, so they definitely uh, love to exercise. Um, the big thing is just making sure Sure that you have an activity outside of work that that uh, you can do that uh, is important and you can look forward to after work. So for me, um, I'm on a, a canine search team uh, with my dog, and so we get to go out and do a lot of training uh, and go out and do things. And so it's definitely something I look forward to out of work. I think, yeah, I think uh, having a balanced lifestyle, even for you guys, you know, when you're when you're done with school every day, you 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 certainly don't think about school all the time, but you do your homework and those type of things. The same thing for folks in here is, 
you know, we, when you get off work, you, you try to get away from work for a little while and, and um, unwind and then uh, regroup for the next day? That's a great question. Um, hi, I'm Anna Claire. Um, what was your most exciting moment in missing control? Well, there's lots of exciting moments here. Um, I know personally for me, uh, one of the most one, uh, exciting ones was actually working console for the first time. Um, you know, the way that we train, uh, we start in the back room, uh, so not here in, in uh, the picker, but in the back room. And so sending your first command in a real vehicle, it, it's quite a quite an exciting moment. Uh, I actually have printed out my desk, the first command I sent to the space station. Um, another exciting thing for me uh, was working my first shuttle mission here in the front room. So I worked at STS-134, uh, that's the last flight of Endeavour, and uh, I actually worked the Orbit 1 shift, which is the shift where um, the shuttle was docking. So it's cool, you know, looking up at the big board and seeing, seeing the shuttle come in for the last time uh, for Endeavour and, you know, watching all that. It, it's definitely a surreal, surreal feeling up here. Hi, my name is Clara, and I would like to know what is Capcom's most important job that they need to do? Well, Ca Capcom, as you know, is, uh, is the only one that uh, talks directly to the crew on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, one of their most important jobs is actually translating what, what I tell them into crew speak. Uh, so, you know, we talk on the loops with lots of acronyms, lots of system uh, issues that we're working, and then Capcom takes all those and packages it. So the crew, we only talk to the crew once about a certain issue, but also um, making sure that it's clear, it's clear for the crew. Uh, you know, sometimes... Sometimes we spit out a lot of words and they make sense to us, but it may not make sense to the crew. So um, that's definitely one of the, the, probably the most important job. Hi, I'm Emma Maurer. And um, my question is, does mission control control everything or just control some things or do you control nothing or do you just in monitor all of the time? Well, that's a good question because um, um, obviously mission control is very integral to what's going on up in space and I think their crew relies heavily on that and then Jesse can probably elaborate. Yeah, you'd, you'd probably be amazed to learn that uh, you know we send thousands of commands every day to the space station uh, between us here as well as, as well as our uh, international partners around the world. And so those those commands uh, control the systems. Uh, also in in uh, Marshall Space Flight Center, uh, they send they send commands to do the payload operations. So um, the advantage of doing that uh, from the ground is it frees up the crew to uh, do other activities that we can't do. Um, for instance, payload ops, which I think you see in the background, uh, Don doing payloads. Um, they they change out uh, payloads all the time. Uh, also any maintenance tasks. So if something fails, we need them to put their hands on the hardware and fix it. So um, by controlling all the systems down here, it gives gives the crew the ability to uh, get more tasks done. So great question. Hi, my name is Rube, and how long is the ISS going to be in space? That's a great question. Yeah, uh, they, they, I think right now we're, um, we're approved to go through 2020, uh, so that's in eight years now. Um, however, we're currently working on extending that to 2027, I believe. Um, the, the big long, uh, long pole on that is obviously the, the structure itself. Uh, so ISS uh, first flew in 1998. So it's already been up there for, for several years. Uh, and a lot of the systems on board and the structure itself uh, is getting old. So um, that's one of the challenges we're looking at is seeing how much margin we still have to be able to get that far. And of course, all the uh, all the spare parts. Uh, you know, we don't like it when things fail, but things do fail. So all the spare parts on board is important. Hi, my name is Madeline Cardinali. What kind of qualities and previous experiences do you have that you feel really benefit your career working in mission control? Well, my my back room, uh, background is as a uh, chemical engineer. Uh, so I received my bachelor's in chemical engineering. Um, and so an engineering math science background is very important to working here. Um, there's also the, the subtle qualities, um, never, never taking what's told to you for granted. Uh, you know, we always strive to understand the why and the what, what is going on, you know, look, at, look deeper, uh, and that's all, all on our own accord. So um, definitely 
uh, you need to be uh, forward thinking, uh, you know, always asking what's the next thing and del delving deeper on your own into whatever you're looking at. So, um, you know, your, your science experiments in school, uh, you know, definitely trying to understand, understand it more, uh, it definitely helps. That's a great question. Hi, my name is Patrick, and my question is, who started Mission Control, and what year was it? <laughs> that's, that's a good question. Yeah, um, well, it goes way back. Actually, the very first Mission Control was not even here. It was down in Florida when uh, the first United Space astronauts were launched, and then uh, there was a decision made to build this facility. This, of course, this room has been changed from what it was in the early uh, uh, Gemini days. Gemini was when two astronauts flew on capsules, and that was when it first opened. It was back in uh, this room back in 1964-65 time frame during the early days before we even went to the moon. And uh, it's transitioned a little bit for space shuttle, and then uh, now most recently to the room that you see here, which is uh, uh, much more modernized with uh, better technology in terms of the consoles and um, human factors were involved in that, right, Jesse? That uh, uh, you know they took that into account because they knew that flight controllers would be in here for long periods of time, as opposed to what they were, you know, back in the early days for long missions like this space station, right? Yes, that, that's that's true. Um, you know, we're also looking forward. Uh, so we have in testing right now um, the next mission control. Uh, so what that's going to look like uh, for the Orion project, uh, and you know that's definitely continuing to mo modernize the system, but also uh, the human factors part of it. And you know we we learned things uh, here in Pico One that you know we we can improve on, and so we're improving those. Um, it, it's definitely changed over the years, and it's amazing to look at the pictures around here of what what it used to look like, and uh, what it now looks like. Yeah, great question. That is a great question. Hi, my name is Elizabeth, and what do you think is the coolest feature on the ISS? <laughs> the, the coolest feature? Um, well, I, I definitely say from, from the cruise perspective, it's the cupola. Uh, so the cupola is basically a bay of windows, uh, and it faces the Earth. So um, you've probably seen a lot of the really cool pictures that they've sent down, uh, also the cool video um, from sunrise, sunset, during the day, um, even during the night, they've, they've taken video of, of night passes. And so it's it definitely cool looking out the window. Um, my perspective, I'm a systems guy, so um, I have interesting uh, interesting modules with systems, but uh, that's obviously not something that other people find interesting. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kira, and my question is, about how many times a day does Mission Control lose connection with the ISS? That's actually a great question. Um, we have an area called the uh, zone of exclusion, um, and that's usually about every 90 minutes uh, that we lose calm with the vehicle. Um, it's usually about 10 minutes long. Uh, that gives us a time to uh, take a break uh, while, while the crew uh, continues. Um, the, the interesting thing is that we can close that gap if we need to. Uh, so usually doing uh, critical ops, so um, say a vehicle's coming, uh, robotics, EBAs, things like that, we, we can ask the network to give us more time. And so at that time, we usually have all the time uh, that we want, um, but we still have what's called a handover time, uh, which is about 20 seconds where our antennas need to go from one angle to another uh, to pick up another satellite. So those, those are actually fairly common. Good question. Hello, my name is Anna Carmina. How do you get the medications to the astronauts? That's that's a great question. Um, the obviously the medication uh, is provided um, via visiting vehicle, so it's on board. Uh, we don't in real time uh, send it to them. Um, we do have a console called the surgeon console. Um, they they're the flight surgeon for the crew, so they uh, they know the crew. Uh, they've worked with the crew for many years as they've uh, gone through training, and so um, they they know uh, what the crew needs uh, for different different ailments that they they might face on board. Hi, my name is Cariel. What kind of experiences have you had in mission control? Well, yeah, as, as I already mentioned, uh, you know, I have the 
the I, I did come in in time to to work a few shuttle flights um, as as a um, ISS support. Um, I you know the biggest thing now is just uh, increment operations. So I get to I get to support uh, usually about one week uh, every couple months um, that you know I come in here and and work uh, with the crew uh, and also. Um, as increment lead, uh, as actually the increment lead for the last crew uh, before Dan Burbank came home, uh, that's there's a lot of planning that goes into each of these flights, and so it it's definitely an experience that you you get to do when you come here. Hi, my name is Lauren. How many? How has mission control changed over the years? That that yeah. is a good question. Yeah, that's kind of what we were talking about earlier. So it's it's changed. Uh, quite a bit from over the years, uh, from the early days of uh, Apollo, even before that, to, to what you're looking at now, right? Yeah, the, the interesting thing is uh, right above us uh, is called Picker 2, uh, which is uh, the old Apollo Picker. Uh, that's preserved. Uh, it's a historical site, uh, and so you get to get to take a view of what it used to look like, and this room actually looked exactly like that uh, before it transitioned over to Space right. Station. Um, and even Space Station, we've had two flight control rooms. So uh, we used to be in what's called Blue Picker uh, before we outgrew that uh, as the station got bigger, uh, and then we transitioned over here. Yeah, the Mission Control Center is very, very large. You're looking at one room, but there's a flight control room, like Jesse said, above us. There's one down the hall that was used for space shuttle and will probably transition to a future spacecraft like Orion that Jesse mentioned, the, the next generation of human space transport that the that the NASA's helping develop or is developing. So uh, it's a very big building that uh, houses uh, very different kinds of uh, flight control depending on what actually is going on. And of course, if there's training going on for another mission, right, you do, you're you always doing simulations for future flights as well. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm actually in training uh, to, to learn another system. So I'm learning our internal thermal control system. Uh, so it's always evolving. Uh, you get to grow and, and learn more things as you go through your career. So here's a good example of somebody who's continuing to learn even though he's already out of school. So you guys can look forward to that too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How did Orion, well, how will you get Orion into space? That's that's a good question. Um, there's two vehicles right now that, that uh, we're working on. So uh, the original Orion's, um, so the first couple flights, I believe, um, will actually be flown on a commercial vehicle, uh, so the Atlas uh, launch vehicle. As it transitions, uh, we're going to go to what's called a uh, space launch system. Uh, shuttle drive uses shuttle hardware, um, and it's, it's a new vehicle that will allow us to go farther. Uh, it's about the size, I believe, of a Saturn V, so it's a very big vehicle. What would you do if an astronaut um, was like life-threatening sick? Yeah, that that's always um, that's actually something that we uh, that we are we have plans for. Um, you know, that on board the crew uh, does have uh, two of the return vehicles. Uh, they're called the Soyuz, uh, the Russian vehicle. And you know, if we had a crew member get critically ill, um, we can always bring them home. Um, and land in Russia and get them to uh, more medical support. Of course, um, his crewmates would need to come home with him because uh, then we don't want to leave them with no escape vehicle. Uh, so uh, we do have that plan and we can execute it if, if we needed to. Luckily, we've never gotten there yet. All right. <laughs> How many times does the I... ISS go around the world in a day? I, that's a good question. Um, the ISS actually orbits uh, the Earth every nine, uh, 90 minutes, uh, which I believe that equates to 15 orbits in a day, yep. something about that. Um, and so uh, we, we track it, um, and you know every day they, they go around the Earth. Uh, every 90 minutes they get a sunrise and a sunset. So it, it's definitely different than what you have on the ground here. Yeah, the, the space station is traveling about 17,000 miles per hour, so that's about 
for you guys, it's about five miles every second. So uh, it travels very fast at uh, what's known as orbital velocity, and, and it's about 250 miles above the Earth right now. So uh, as Jesse said, you know, once every hour and a half, it's, it goes all the way around the Earth. Hi, my name is Mara, and I was wondering how someone got assigned to a council in mission control. Well, um, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I came in, I, I was actually hired um, as an ECLIS, uh, so a life support officer. Um, it used to be that uh, you'd be hired within that group, uh, so a specific, uh, towards a specific console. Um, now, uh, we've actually transitioned more towards generic uh, systems controllers. So um, you, when you get hired in here, um, you get to experience each of the different groups uh, and basically provide your recommendation of what what group you want to work for. Um, and you know sometimes that's not always possible, uh, but you know we definitely like to uh, allow people to to have the opportunity to work for whatever position they want, uh, which there's lots of them here. That's a good question. Hi, my name is Liam, and I wanted to know what's the hardest task you ever had to face? The hardest task I've ever had to face? Um, you know, the, the simulated tasks, uh, which we always get, get put to, through the ringer uh, in a simulation. Um, but I, I think in real time, I, I think the hardest thing I had to do was actually come in. Um, I wasn't on call uh, for a flight um, that we had Russian computer problems that uh, caused a rapid depress to be enunciated on board. And this was actually while the crew was um, in what we call camp out. So they were in the airlock uh, down at 10-2 PSI. And so I was asked to come in uh, to help the on-console team uh, basically reconfigure all our systems after that. And the challenge there was the mixed config we were in, because as I mentioned, the crew was, uh, was at 10-2 in the airlock. Uh, so there were a lot of different things we had to consider um, and, and work through. Um, will there be other, I mean, have there been thoughts about other ISSs around orbiting other planets? I believe there actually has been. Um, there, there are currently talks uh, about putting one, um, I think it's past the moon. Uh, there's a uh, gravity gradient spot that, that actually works for putting a space station there. Um, it actually provide uh, basically a destination uh, for the Orion on its way to deep space. Um, as, as far as the ISS hardware, uh, I don't believe there's actually any plan uh, for a similar to the ISS. So it would be an advanced version of the space station. Yeah, that's the beauty about the space station that we have now is that we're learning how to live long duration time periods at this altitude. Uh, because when we go out further out, obviously it means it's going to take longer to get back. So you need to, you definitely need to know uh, uh, how to live for long duration stays in space because you, your trip will become much longer. And that's that's uh, one of the things we're doing at the International Space Station right now. So those are great questions, and uh, we really enjoyed uh, visiting with everybody today in Pennsylvania. And uh, you guys uh, keep studying hard and. Uh, Hopefully you'll make your way right here to this room and uh, join Jesse along with other flight controllers as part of the, the team here in uh, Mission Control. So thanks a lot for joining us, everybody. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much.